have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. But death could not hold him. In all power, he raised three days later, showing his sovereignty over death, giving us an opportunity for eternal life, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And this is not by our works, but by grace through faith. You see, after raising from the dead, Jesus would then reveal himself to his followers and hundreds of others, showing them the very holes in his hands and his feet that left everyone in astonishment. These once frightened men, these disciples, had this new zeal and joy to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And as Mark mentioned last week in Acts 1.8, Jesus promises his disciples that they will receive the Holy Spirit, the helper, because he knew that they and us cannot do this life without God here on earth. It was 50 days later after he resurrected and ascended to heaven. We are here at the Pentecost. This is a time of harvest and celebration for Jewish families. And this is the time where Jesus would come through on his promise. And his spirit came down like a violent rushing wind from heaven, filling the upper room of the 120 that were present. They were praising God in different languages and there were travelers from 15 different nations standing outside this upper room perplexed on how these uneducated guys were speaking these languages and they could only come to one conclusion is that they were drunk. It's 9 a.m. Peter stands up and he raises his voice. The same Peter who had denied Jesus not once, twice, three times. The same Peter who at times was very impulsive and had to get checked by Jesus. The same Peter, sorry, checked means uh, we don't give you a check of money. It's like, yo, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Jesus had to put Peter in his place. He was impulsive. This same Peter stands up and he is sharing the gospel. It reminds us that even though we have a failed past and we've done things that God um, has checked us in, he can still use us. This same Peter stands and proclaims the gospel with such power and authority to a crowd of people. This crowd of people, it's not like they didn't know Jesus. They actually witnessed the miracles of him. They were even part of the crowd that mocked him and used lawless people to kill him. And the gospel was shared, hearts were pierced, and Peter calls this crowd to repentance and to be baptized in the name of Jesus. 3,000 people later, the early church was started, and now we find ourselves here today at our passage in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, which says this. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. The believers, they were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 2020, I don't know about you, but I remember the beginning of this year like yesterday. Many churches and businesses, they donned these slogans boasting a new fresh vision for the future, a 2020 vision. A brand new decade was upon us and so many of us had big plans. This was going to be the year. The engagement, the marriage, the proposal, the, um, the new promotion, the job. This was going to be the year, the retirement. But as God, being the author of life, decided to show us that our vision for 2020 wasn't quite his vision for 2020. I mean, no one in their right mind could have planned 2020 on their own. From social unrest to the pandemic, fires, tornadoes, Zoom, kids being at home doing school, more exposure to the reality of sex trafficking, Kobe, the Black Panther, our hero, and the Clippers not making it to the finals. Well, actually, we could have planned that one. Um, but there's so much more. But simply put, there was no way on earth anyone could have planned this except God. And I believe God wanted us to experience these things to give us eyes to see something that we would not have been able to see if 2020 went our way. 
He wanted us to know that there is a purpose in the pain many of us are experiencing and the world is experiencing. And I believe that purpose, his church, you and I, those that call ourselves members of Vantage Point Church and God's, God's global church, we can accomplish. We are the only ones that can accomplish this purpose. The task of bringing the gospel, this good news to a lost and hopeless world. What a privilege that we have to partner with God in his work. And I, and I know many of us, even myself included at times, have struggled to grasp the fact that the church has not always made, you know, the essentials list. But before you let your frustrations and anger grab a hold of your heart, I want to remind you of this truth. The church was never about a building. It was always about a people, a people called to something greater than themselves. It's a vision of community that brings people alike that don't look alike, act alike, vote alike, yet we're brought together by the love and mercy of our God. Here's what I want us to realize, though. This is really important because at the end of the day, at the end of this pandemic, I believe God knows who is a member of the church and who is just a member of the building. He knows who is a member of the church or who is just a member of the building. Sure, I understand churches are starting to meet uh, slowly but surely and, and, and we're starting to get back into the building. A lot of us have been outside, but here's my fear is that many of us will go back to being members of the building where we show up not really engaged and we go and sit down in the auditorium, never lifting our voices and worship with our church family. We won't try to get involved. We won't get in community or small groups because heaven knows what if people know who we truly are. And as soon as the last song is over, we make a beeline to the car because we don't want to be seen or talked to by anyone. God desires so much more for you, so much more for our church. And we are going to have to look at the early church here for some wisdom and encouragement and what it looks like to be a church that is centered and ruled by the gospel. There are many characteristics of the early church that we can learn from, from that passage that I just read. But I want to focus on one today. I believe the first portion of Acts chapter 2 verse 42 is the heartbeat of the church. And this is what he mentions here. Luke mentions this first for a reason, I believe, and it says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. This may seem small, but it is the heartbeat in which the early church operated and how I believe we as believers should operate. What is this teaching? We got to take a step back and look into the first part of Acts 2, where Peter is sharing this gospel to the crowd. He is quoting Old Testament prophecies, things that were shared that would happen that are now happening. And in verse 21, he states to everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. In verse 22, he talks about the many miracles. Even that crowd saw Jesus performing these miracles on earth. And in verse 24, he talks about how God raised him from the dead, showing that he cannot be held by death. And in verse 32, he transitions and he says that we disciples, Peter and the rest of the crew, we are witnesses to Jesus's resurrection. And ultimately in verse 38, how they must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins so that they too may receive the Holy Spirit and be saved from the corrupt generation they were living in. He says this again in verse 42, be devoted to these teachings, the gospel. I love this definition of what it means to be devoted. It means to continue to do something with intense effort, despite difficulty, staying in a fixed direction. It is a vow. It is to attach oneself to. I also love what's not said in this verse. It does not say anything anywhere where it says be devoted to uh, this political party or to this party candidate or to this sports team. Be devoted to uh, what others think of you. No, no, no. It says be devoted to the teachings of God's word, to the gospel. I believe COVID isn't the only pandemic we have on our hands. I believe we have a devoted pandemic because we have devoted ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasure to so many things other than the gospel and we are left empty and not usable for God's kingdom. I wanna spend the rest of our time focusing on four quick things that I believe will happen when we devote ourselves to the apostles preaching of the gospel. Number one, when we devote ourselves to the gospel, we find our identity. What we devote ourselves to, we eventually become. What we are devoted to directs us. This was a problem with God's people for centuries. In the Old Testament, God made a promise to his people. 
Be devoted to me and I will make your name great. God freed his people from captivity and all he was asking them to do was be devoted to me. But they kept choosing these other things to satisfy themselves. And we are reminded of this frustration towards his people in Jeremiah 2, 13 where God says this, my people, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, they've abandoned me, the spring of living water, and they've dug up their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold any water. And it reminds me of a story of of my son and daughter. Um, My daughter, India, she is uh, kind of at this stage now where she thinks she's all her little brother's mom and she likes to take care of them. And so they are in a season where they love taking baths together. They enjoy this so much. And so we get them all locked in and I'm, I'm shampooing Leo's hair and we got these, um, these cups. We got these new cups here. And on these cups, uh, it's they're, they're bath cups. And so what would happen is Indy, she would uh, see Leo's shampoo in his hair and she would want to help him. And so she would pour water. She, would get, she wouldn't pour water, but she would get water um, using this cup from the bathtub. And as you see that there's holes in this cup and and by the time where she would get water and then want to go pour it over her brother's hair, she had nothing. She had nothing to give that like she had nothing to give because there was a hole at the bottom. So she found herself frustrated. And, And this is what we do as God's people is we create these broken cisterns, these cups, these things that have holes that are supposed to hold the living water of God. And we devote ourselves to these other things. And therefore, we are not able to 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 give this living water to anyone else. We are not able to to take it for ourselves because at the end of the day, it runs out and we're left with with nothing. That simple illustration, I believe, shows us that we cannot place our identity in good things outside of God. There's a lot of good things that we could place our identity in. But at the end of the day, just because it's a good thing doesn't mean it's a God thing. Number two, when we devote ourselves to the gospel, we eliminate pride and become living proof. In his book, Gospel Primer, Milton Vincent has this incredible quote. He says, preaching the gospel to myself every day mounts a powerful assault against my pride and serves to establish humility in its place. Nothing suffocates my pride more than a daily reminder regarding the glory of my God and the gravity of my sins and the cross of God's own son in my place. Also, the gracious love of God lavished on me because of Christ's death. It is always humbling to remember, especially viewed against the backdrop of the hell that I deserve. Man, when we are devoted to the gospel, our pride is eliminated. We don't have time for this self-help improvement market that's worth up, upwards of about $3.2 billion, self-help. These books, these programs, these events that focus on you helping yourself. We must keep our eyes on our Savior, who is the only one who can help us. And we are and when we are devoted to our to his word, we understand that we can't pull our lives up by ourselves. It is Jesus and his word that can only do that. Now, I'm not saying that a self-help book will help you improve in a certain area, but that's a sub point to God's word. God's word is the main hub that we should be devoted to that drives our life and our identity. Number three, when we devote ourselves to the gospel, we will live and stay in community. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch the latest Netflix Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma. I'd encourage you to check it out. The film highlights the concerns of former tech employees, big time employees, who say social media is undermining the shared sense of reality that strengthens society. It explains how social media is a drug that essentially keeps us isolated to ourselves and to voices that sound like us, people that look like us, that act like us. We basically get to pick the type of community we want to be in. We get to follow who we want to follow and hear voices that we want to hear. And anything that isn't that, we will just cancel out, people and programs alike. The Pew Research has released studies where the next generation believes the most significant relationships can be found online versus in person, leaving them to stay in this web-based sense of reality of community. The early church answers this dilemma. 
They met together. They did communion together. They worshiped together. They helped each other. They sold things so they could help each other. They spent time in one another's homes. They were united by one thing, and that was the blood of Jesus. We must not lose sight that when things open up, God designed us for community. He designed us for community. When the social distancing is over, know that he designed us for that. Sometimes that can feel uncomfortable because when you're alone and when you're in isolation, no one is calling you to be accountable for anything. No one is pushing you outside of yourself. But man, we must be committed to that. And lastly, when we are devoted to the gospel, we are free and essential to be the church to a world in need of good news. Again, not the building, but the people of God. We don't need a government official to tell us that we are essential. We bear God's image and we can proclaim his glory. When we remain to the gospel, we are free and essential to be the church in a lost world. A church like the persecuted church in China, described by Nick Ripkin in his book, Insanity of God. Nick writes this, these Chinese believers found themselves at the mercy of government and political officials these police officials as well. They were being tormented. The conversation details that security police would regularly harass a Chinese believer who owned the property where this house church meets. The police said, you have got to stop these meetings. And if you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and we will throw you into the street. The Chinese believer, bold in his response, the owner of the house, he says, do you want my house? Do you want my farm? Well, if you do, then you need to talk to Jesus because I gave this property to him. The security police don't know how to make of this answer. So then they say, well, we don't know how to get to Jesus, but we could certainly get to you. When we take your property, you and your family will have nowhere to live. The house church believer responds by saying that we will be free to trust God for shelter as well as for our daily bread. If you keep this up, we will beat you, the prosecutors told them. Well, great, then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing. The believer's response amazed them. And it, and, it, and it continued to make him mad. And the police officer said, well, great, then we will put you in prison. And by now the believer's response is almost predictable. Well, then we will be free to preach the good news of Jesus to the captives, to set them free. We will be free to plant churches in prison. And if you do that, we will kill you, the frustrated authorities said. And with utter consistency in their voice, the house church believers replied, then we will be free to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. Church, God is calling us to be his church to a world that is desperately in need of good news. Would we consider everything as lost for the sake of knowing Christ, would we stop building our own cisterns that cannot hold any water? And would we actually repent and turn away from the things that are focusing us on ourselves, repent from the ways in which we've treated our other fellow believers and, and, and repent from the ways that we have actually not been a witness to Christ because we have not devoted ourselves to the gospel. Church, my prayer is that no matter what anyone says, we would live our lives as if we are essential to God's work and his kingdom. When we come into this building, Lord willing soon, and I cannot wait to do that with you. I cannot wait to worship with you. I cannot wait to be in community with you. My prayer and hope is that we would be so devoted to this gospel that we, at the end of Acts chapter two, verse 47, God would continue to add to the number of people that will be in his kingdom for all of eternity by our devotion and obedience to him. So would that be the thing that we are devoted to for the rest of our lives?